Good morning, and welcome to Foothills Christian Church on this holiday weekend. Um, we know some of our friends and family are gone this week, including um, our youth groups. So middle school and high schoolers are up in Payson on a retreat, so prayers to David and Tawny who are spending this weekend with them and safe travels when they return tomorrow. Um, if you are new to Foothills, we want to especially extend a warm welcome. We are an open and affirming church. We hope everyone since is a sense of belonging here. If you are new, we have um, connect cards that we invite you to fill out. Um, it's a way for you to, for us to help you discover more about the church. And if you're joining online, we're glad you're here too. There's a connect card link in the description for the video there that you can find. And here at Foothills, we begin our time of worship by sharing in a call and response together. So if you are able, I invite you to stand and join me in the parts that say all. Transfigure the church, O oh Lord. Transfigure the nations, O oh Lord. Transfigure this congregation, O oh Lord. And now come, let us worship together. May the peace of Christ be with you. And as comfortable, I invite you to remain standing as we join our voices together for praise. Please. 
Thank you this morning for your love, your compassion, and your forgiveness. You give us hope when we are brokenhearted, and you breathe life into us, and you restore us. When we feel worthless and undeserving, you remind us of your love, your goodness, and your kindness. Your sovereignty, your grace, and your mercy is never ending, and your reckless love is overwhelming. We worship and adore you and you alone, Lord. To you be all the glory the honor, and the praise. Amen. Lord, I spoke a word you were singing over me. so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. Serve it, still you can. 
No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, come and have it with me. There's no wall you won't kick down, fly you won't tear down, come and have it me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. No wall you won't kick down, fly you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, fly you won't tear down, coming after me. morning. Please join me in prayer. Radiant God, you revealed yourself to us in your son, Jesus, when he was transfigured on the mountain before his disciples. Reveal yourself to us anew so we might enlighten others with the good news of your love. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. seated, I invite children to come forward and join me on, near the steps by the candle for a children's moment. All right. Good morning. It's good to see y'all today. All right. So, of all of you, if you, if I were to go in your cars, would I find, do you think, could you, do you think I could find a coin and a cup holder? Or if I were to go into your house and your living room and took apart the cushions of your couch, do you think I might find a coin there? Anywhere? Yeah? Yeah, I see some nodding. Well, there's a story in the Bible where Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a woman who had ten coins but lost one of them, and she tore apart her entire house looking for a lost coin. So I have lost some coins this morning, and there are coins over the, the steps that direction, and there are some coins that I lost over by the piano. So if you can choose either one, go, and you can go find one or two coins to come see if you can find a coin or two. And there's some that way. All right, and then when you come back, you can pick up one of these boxes from the basket. Okay, V, did you find one? Okay, go over there. And if you only find one or two to make sure we have enough lost coins for everyone. Okay, and then when you come back, you can pick up a box and you can go sit back down. Did everyone find a coin? No. Did anyone find more than two coins and they want to share with a neighbor? You gave Andrew some? All right. Anyone? Okay. And then once you're back, you can find a box or come get a box from the basket. All right. Who still needs a coin? 
Okay, I found some coins. I lost some coins in this basket, too. I'm losing them everywhere. Here's some. Okay, you want to take some? All right, Phoebe, did you need some coins? You found some? Okay, so these coins are coin boxes. And just like the woman in the story that Jesus tells, I want to invite you to find, look for coins all week long and see how full you can make your box. Because these boxes are for week of compassion. It starts this Sunday and it goes all week long. And then if you're at church next Sunday, if you can bring them back, and they can be an offering that you turn in because all the money that gets raised for Week of Compassion goes to help people all around the world. They help bring food to people who are hungry. They help rebuild houses where people who've lived somewhere where their houses is destroyed, maybe because of a flood or a hurricane, all kinds of things. And so all of these little coins, they might seem really, really small and insignificant, but when we add all of our coins together, we can help bring the kingdom of God here on earth, just like that story that Jesus tells about. All right, well, you, oh, you keep, your, your coins are jumping. Okay, I invite you to um, pray with me. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for all these children. We ask that you um, look after them and pour out your peace upon them as they look for coins this week, reminders of your grace and goodness in the world. We pray that as they leave, that they continue to worship you and wonder about you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, you are free. There's Kingdom Kids for third through fifth graders and worship and wonder for preschool to second graders, or you can go back to with the people you came with, and I'll see you in a little bit.
Once again, I invite you into a spirit of prayer. And this is the time of prayer where we lift up our joys and concerns. So I'll pause twice on this prayer. The first time, um, allow some silence so that you can pray for any concerns you might have by saying a name or place out loud or praying silently if you prefer. And the second time of pause, I'll um, be inviting us to lift up our joys. And then finally, um, invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer, which will, the words will be on the screen behind me. Will you pray with me? O oh God of mystery, God of transfiguration, help us to see the world differently. Help us to experience places where heaven and earth meet, where the veil is thin, where we view life through your lens. Help us to find the holy wherever we are to experience mystery and wonder. May we experience awe that causes us to tremble in your presence. May we hear your voice call to us. May we feel your gently help us when we are down. May we experience the holy all around, knowing you are ever present and ever faithful. Your steadfast love endures forever in us and around us and beyond us. And we need these reminders, especially when we are down, when we feel the weight of pain pushing down on us. We pray for our concerns that come to mind, prayers for healing for those who are suffering, Prayers for your presence where there is loneliness. Hear now our prayers of concern. Hear our prayers, O oh God, for you are a God of transfiguration. You transform and you change and you renew us. You turn our mourning into dancing and we give thanks for all those things we have to be grateful for. For birthdays and celebrations, for children and coins, for congregations singing and praise. For long weekends, in times with friends and family, we give thanks. Hear now our prayers of joy. Hear our prayers, O oh God. Gather up all the ones spoken and those held within our hearts as we continue to pray to you, praying together the prayer you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from Psalm 41, verses 7 through 10. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They think that a deadly thing has fastened on me, that I will not rise again from where I lie. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate of my bread, has lifted the heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them.
When I was in college, I went on a weekend trip with the conference of other college students around the country. I don't remember anything about it. I don't remember why we were there, what we learned. But I do remember that the whole weekend was spent on a bus, um, one of those buses you rent out, and it was filled with 30 college students who all met each other for the first time. And we had several different stops in whatever city we were in. And so we had this ritual. We'd get off the bus, get back on the bus, but to make sure we didn't lose anyone, we did a good old-fashioned roll call. And the leader would go through every person's name, and after each person's name, they would shout, here. And every once in a while, someone might say, present, because they want to shake things up. <laughs> but what I do remember more than anything else was there was this guy who you could not forget. His name was Titus. And every time it came to his name in the roll call, he didn't say, here. He didn't say, present. When his name was spoken, Titus, he would say, behold. And that's exactly what we did. We would behold Titus's presence because he was someone you would never, you could never miss. You, all these years later, I don't remember anything except for Titus and how he invited us to behold him. <laughs> I could never muster up that much audacity to replicate it, even though it's been a memory that has stuck with me. This morning, we are going to hear a story from scripture in which we are invited to do just that to behold the splendor of God. It's quite literally a mountaintop experience. It's known formally as the transfiguration story, um, when Peter, James, and John join Jesus up top on a mountain. Um, the Celtic tradition likes to call these moments thin places, where heaven and earth seem to overlap for just a moment, and you can behold the splendor and wonder of God. So I invite us to listen for just that. Um, we are going to hear from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, starting with verse 1. I think there might be more verses there, but if you could skip to verse 1. I think I already edited it. Um, and this is the NRSV translation. And sometimes, I really like the NRSV translation for the most part, but sometimes it just misses it. And this is one of those passages I think they miss out on because um, there's a word that's going to show up twice. The word is suddenly. But most other places, they'll translate this word as behold. And in fact, there's even one time where it gets omitted, but I'll try my best to remember where it, says, where it is and um, replace it. So let us listen for a word of God. And as we do, I invite you to think of your own mountain top stories. Do you have a mountain story when you've experienced the thinness of where heaven and earth meet. A reading from Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And as he was transfigured before them, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became bright as light. Behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will set up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and they were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up. Do not be afraid. And when they raised their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm assuming that's the end of that. Okay. <laughs> Barbara Brown Taylor is Episcopal priest um, and famous preacher. And um, when talking about the transfiguration, she suggests that if we keep reading this story, as they go down the mountain, Jesus instructs Peter, James, and John to tell no one. Don't tell, keep this a secret. Do not tell anyone. So she suggests if Jesus didn't talk about it, and Peter and James and John didn't talk about, maybe we shouldn't 
talk about it either. Um, but here we are with a sermon, and we're going to talk about it. But um, last week we were with a parable, and after this Sunday, then all the Sundays leading up to Easter, we're going to spend time with parables. And in Bible study, Terry always talks about bi- um, parables, liking them to jokes, that a joke doesn't work if you have to explain the punchline. And the same is true of a parable. Parables don't work if you have to explain the parable. Parables are meant to be experienced and heard and a story to enter into. Well, the same I think is true of the transfiguration and all mystical experiences. If we dissect them, we lose something. Maybe we shouldn't talk about this mystical experience that Peter, James, and John had on the mountain. So I'm going to kind of shy away from trying to explain the phenomenon of the bright light and that uh, mystical experience, but talk around it and see what else we can glean from this passage. Do you have a mountain story? A lot of my, yes, you do. Some of you do. Yes, good. I want to hear them. Um, A few years ago for my husband and I's 10th anniversary, we headed to Utah and packed four state um, national parks into one trip. And a lot of my mountaintop experiences come back from that trip, all the different ones we went to. But one in particular was Zion National Park, and I had prepared for it. I tried to research it and study it and make sure I was in enough shape to hike Angel's Landing, the famous hike and one of the famous hikes in Zion National Park, where you go up after hiking up and up and up, you finally arrive at this slender mountain peak where you are um, hiking on a razorback thin edge of a spine of a mountain. And there are chains there to help you get to the top. Um, But I feel like the biggest obstacle of all were the other people. (laughs) Because if you zoom back, it looks like ants crawling on top of each other, trying to find their way around each other um, carefully. And then when you get to the very end and you want to take this magical moment in, um, there's this like courtesy thing where you're each trying to get your moment the edge so you could capture the camera and take the camera and capture a picture and make it look like you're having this most magical splendor time and that no one else is there. (laughs) And then you post it online and everyone else is like, wow, that looks really amazing. But if you were to widen the lens, you see the long line of hundreds of people waiting to do the exact same thing. I thought I was going to maybe like try to down some, some of those pictures, because this happens everywhere. Um, ever since, um, now that we can share our um, vacation photos, not just with family, with a photo album, now we can share them with the entire world, all of these beautiful places around the world are being discovered by everyone, which in a way is wonderful. People are getting out in nature, but that means there are crowds and crowds of people, and people are cult- um, curating these moments with your cameras, trying to... Um, sh- capture it in a way that really is not the full picture of what's happening because you're there with hundreds of other strangers doing the exact same thing. Now, Peter, in today's story, I think he gets a bad rep, and we like to chastise him. We're, we're telling him, oh, you're just trying to capture this moment like someone else taking out their camera phone and curating a picture that really doesn't tell the full story. Because when they're up on the mountain and Jesus is shining, Peter notices it, and he's beholding Jesus in all of his glory, and he says, it is good for us to be here. I will make tents, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Let us stay here and linger. It is good for us to be here. I have lots of questions. Like, where is he going to get these tents? They're up on a mountain. And then we chastise Peter, like, no, you're missing the point. You're not supposed to capture it and try to confine the holy in this moment. But if we look at all of Scripture, I think Peter was onto something. Because in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, before the people of God had a temple, the place where God is said to dwell with the people, before they had that, before they had the promised land and they were a people on the move in the wilderness, They get these instructions to build a tent, to build a tabernacle so that the presence of God could dwell with them wherever they were to go. And so he wants to do the same. He wants to put a tent. He wants God to dwell because he is beholding this glorious thing that is happening. 
but that doesn't get entertained. He doesn't get chastised for it. He doesn't get told, oh, that's a great idea, nothing. They just ignore him. And this cloud overcomes the mountain, and they can't see anything anymore. Do you have a mountain story? Moses had a mountain story. Moses, one of the people that is said to have been with Jesus in this story. Moses' mountain story is when they are in the wilderness. And people, um, they're hungry and thirsty, but finally they arrive at Mount Sinai. And Moses' Moses's mountain story is that he climbs up Mount Sinai and he dwells with the splendor of God in that cloud where he receives the Ten Commandments and he's invited to enter into a covenant relationship with God. Do you have a mountain story? Elijah. Elijah has a mountain story. Elijah is a prophet and his story is a little further back in the Hebrew scriptures after um, this wilderness time. He's a prophet. And um, he is said to be at the base of Mount Horeb, which most people think is just another name for Mount Sinai, the same mountain that Moses was on. And Elijah, he was at Mount Horeb, and he was way in a cave. And God's voice says, what are you doing, Elijah? Go out, and I will pass by you. So Moses, um, too many people keep track of Elijah. Elijah. This is Elijah's mountain story. Elijah goes out of the cave, and a great wind comes, but God is not in the wind. And then the earth shakes, and there's an earthquake, but God is not in the shaking. But next, there is a still, small voice. It's really hard to translate. Some say it's a whisper. Some say it's sheer silence, and that God is there in that presence. And that is Elijah's mountain story. Do you have a mountain story? Peter, James, and John, they now have a mountain story. And the story is said to begin like this. Six days later, verse 1 starts. What happened six days ago? Well, six days ago, Peter has confessed that Jesus is the Son of God, and he gets the answer right. It seems like he has studied, he, he finally knows, he grasped the entire picture. But this is six days later a number that shows up other places in the Bible. And the Bible likes to do this. Every, lots of times when numbers show up, there's something more going on. In chapter 1, the very first book of the Bible in Genesis, God is said to create the world in six days, and it is finished. It seems complete. It seems like it's done. But it's not done. We need one more day. We need the seventh day to make it complete, to make it shalom, to make it whole, a day of Sabbath and rest. In this mountain story, Peter thinks that he has arrived. He's six days later after he's made this confession. He thinks he has it figured out. He thinks he has the complete picture. But something is missing. The story ends by Jesus taking them down the mountain and telling them, God's voice tells them to listen to him. And from this moment onward, once Jesus gets off of this mountain, the rest of the gospel is dedicated for Jesus making his way to Jerusalem. And chapter by chapter, he's going to inch his way closer and closer to the cross. The story may have seemed complete to Peter, but it is not done yet. There's still so much more to go. Moses and Elijah, they have mountain stories, but they also have valley stories. Stories in which Moses He's around all these people who are unhappy at him and complain and whine and are frustrated by him. And they um, promise that they're going to do things and then they don't. And Moses has a life that is actually marked with a lot of suffering. Peter sees Moses and Elijah as these great giants of faith. But Jesus is dwelling with them up on the mountain with these two companions that also know not only the mountaintop highs, but the valley lows. Elijah, too, has that mountain story, but Elijah also has valley stories. The reason he was headed to Mount Horeb was because he was ready to end it all. He was fleeing from his life from Queen Jezebel, and he goes, sits under a broom tree, and he says, I just want to end my life. I am done. But that's where an angel visits him, gives him food, gives him water, takes him, tells him to take a good nap, and then gets up and sends him to the mountain. Jesus is drawing upon these giants of faith who know the highs of the mountains but the lows of the valley because he is about to embark on 
immense suffering too. We have mountain stories, but we are also a room full of valley stories, stories of pain and suffering. But I think this story is inviting us to go about our life and to be open, to behold God's glory shining anew. And maybe it is up on a national park mountain with hundreds of other people where we are invited to behold the splendor of God. But maybe we also can catch glimpses of glory to behold in our everyday, ordinary life. These parables that we're going to spend the time with all the way to Easter um, do a thing where they often will draw upon images of ordinary things, like last week, seeds and soil and yeast. Invite us to behold the simple things that are already around us. We're invited to dwell with these moments, whether it's cutting strawberries in the kitchen or watering your plants in the backyard or holding someone else's hand. Let us dwell in these moments too. Let us linger in them. Let us behold God's splendor because we need them for not only our mountain highs but for our valley lows, knowing that we worship a God who knows all of this human experience and is a God who never leaves us is with us from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the valley. This is good news. May we behold it. May we savor it. May we sip the Sabbath, knowing that nothing is ever complete. There's still more to come. And these stories can sustain us, just as this meal does each and every week. For in worship at Foothills, we always come to the communion table, a table where we're invited to see God's glory, not in bright lights, but in ordinary bread and ordinary grape juice. Let us taste and see that God is good right here, right now. Thanks be to God. Amen. said, this is my body, that is for you, do this remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and after supper, uh, supper, also saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, do this as often as you drink, in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please pray with me. Lord, I am humbled by your grace that you would allow your body to be broken and your blood to be poured out on behalf of all you've created, that you seek to have relationships with us and that you hear our prayers, reminding us to behold your presence, reminding us we are welcome at your table and in your kingdom, just as we are, showered with your righteous love. Amen.
There's a holy hush around us as God's glory fills this place. Touch the hem of God's heart. I can almost see God's face and my heart is overflowing with the fullness of God's joy. And I know without a doubt that I've been with the Lord. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel God's mighty power and God's grace. brush of angels' wings, I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Oh, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. One of the defining characteristics of the Foothills community is generosity. Whether that means financially, your time, or your talents, there is a way for you to engage with this church as we show the love of Jesus in our community. As we give today, may we do so in love, joy, peace, and thanksgiving. At Foothills, we don't pass an offering plate. Instead, you are invited to share your offering by placing it in the box located in the lobby on your way out. You can also give online through our website or use text to give. Information about text and online giving is in today's bulletin. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you, Kyle. And today is one of those Sundays where we have a special offering in your bulletins. There's information about the Week of Compassion. Um, and I want to share a short video now to help just share more about what this offering does and how you can partner with it. Every morning brings new challenges. An earthquake, a war, fires burning, floodwaters rising up and up. And so we pray every morning without ceasing. We lift up people in places who are suffering and we hold them in our hearts. But we do not stop there. We put our prayers into action through a week of compassion one blossom of love and justice and mercy at a time. For God's mercies are also new every morning. God's favor is not exhausted, nor has God's compassion ever failed. Week of Compassion is the Relief, Refugee, and Development Mission Fund of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Day in and day out, week in and week out, year in and year out. Week of Compassion transforms suffering into hope. Ashes of despair into blossoms of new and abundant life. Morning after morning. For over 75 years, Week of Compassion has been working with local partners all over the world to respond to disasters when they occur and to do the slow, beautiful work of ongoing development, strengthening communities, one neighborhood, one family, one child of God at a time. Because of your generosity, women are learning to become beekeepers in Haiti, churches in Tornado Alley are rebuilding, Afghan refugees are being resettled, and Ukrainian families are finding long-term support. When the shadows fall, we lift our hearts in prayer 
and then we rise up anew and get to work. We put our prayers into action. A vibrant rainbow of hope for a new future. Spreading the good news that God's mercies really are new every morning. Week of Compassion. Let's pray and act and give and rise up anew together. Week of Compassion is a offering that means a lot to me and um, has made a difference in around the world and in local communities. If you'd like to give today, you can do so with the offering um, envelopes that are in your bulletin or you can give online. And when you, if you do it that way, there's a drop down menu for special offering so you can indicate it that way. Quick story about Week of Compassion. Um, I have too many to share, so I won't share them all, but I've been um, privileged to be a delegate on a few different trips, one to Bosnia to see their efforts after um, long-term development after war, and I've also been to Myanmar with Week of Compassion to visit um, refugee, or actually eternal displaced persons camp um, of the Rohingya um, and all that is going on there. But I've also seen it happen locally. Um, when the church I served in Kentucky was struck down by lightning and destroyed by fire, Week of Compassion was there. And this past October, when we had some strong monsoon winds and our cell tower, which you may be wondering what happened to it and why there's no longer a ch chalice or cross on it, um, the stucco around it started to fall off because of that strong wind. I got a call from the assistant director of Week of Compassion checking in on us and wondering if that strong wind was a storm that affected our neighbors or our congregation members and if there was any grants of solidarity that could be used. And I said, no, it's kind of just this fluke thing. And thankfully, AT&T is responsible um, for that cell tower. Um, maybe I should have taken them up on it because they're um, a little difficult to work with in their um, timeliness and their promptness, but our trustees are working on that and um, it'll be restored. But I just wanted to let you know about how wonderful Week of Compassion is. And it's one week of the year we take up this offering together with disciple congregations all around the country and Canada um, so that as um, things happen, disasters happen, things go unplanned, we can respond timely with a um, great generosity. So I know our church has been a leader in the past, and I have no doubt we'll be a leader um, this week as well in giving to this worthy cause. I wanted to lift at some things happening in the life of our church. So this Wednesday begins the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday. Um, also in your bulletin, maybe you have um, some offerings of how we're going to be gathering for that. There's since been a new location added, so I made new ones on your way out, there's going to be at 9 a.m. You can come for a short Ashes on the Go in the sanctuary. Um, noon, Carolyn Quinn in Central Phoenix is going to offer Ashes on the Go at her office. At 4 p.m., Barbara Steven, who, Stevens, who lives out in um, Sun City. So if you're on the West Far West Valley, you can come to her home, and I have addresses for that. Or you can join us at 7 p.m. at First Christian Church of Scottsdale, where our congregation Cool Water and First Cottsdale will come together for an Ash Wednesday service. And also happening in the life of our church this Sunday um, is an elders meeting after church. And Carolyn probably wants you to know that her office is a little tricky to find. So she will be um, sending out information on our Karen Connect about how to um, maneuver their parking lot and find where she's located. Okay, so look for that on Karen Connection. Um, that's a good point to lift up. I haven't done it in a while. So on Facebook, we have our church's Facebook pages open, but we also have a separate group that's closed where members can connect and share, and it's a busy place where people share prayer concerns or updates about their life. If you don't know about the Karen Connect page, um, I'd love to invite you to that, and um, you can see me if you need more details for it. Um, also tonight, our monthly book club is meeting. It'll meet here at 6 p.m. We're re um, discussing the book, This Here Flesh. All right. So now is a time where we offer a call to discipleship. If there's anyone here looking for a new church to officially call home, we welcome you as new members. One way you can do that is by coming forward during this final song um, to give a confession of faith and tra or transfer a membership. And I'll be there um, ready to greet you if you so choose to do that. But now, if able, I invite you to stand and join your voices together one last time.
this morning to um, say hello and welcome Terry, who comes this morning to um, place her membership at Foothill. So Terry, I ask you the question that um, Peter answered and gave the answer to and before the transfiguration story, um, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ and Son of the living God and accept him as Lord and Savior? Well, I extend a right hand of Christian Fellowship and welcome you to our church family. We're so glad to have you as our newest member. And um, afterwards, I'll invite Terry to stand with me on outside so that you can come and say hello and welcome her yourself. But now if you'll go to the next slide, we have a welcome slide to um, covenant together as a new member. So I invite you to join these words with me. Reaffirming our own faith in Jesus the Christ, we gladly welcome you into this community of faith, enfolding you with our love and committing ourselves to your care. In the power of God's spirit, let us mutually encourage each other to trust God and strengthen one another to serve others. That Christ Church may in all things stand faithful. Amen. After this, we have fellowship over next door in our fellowship hall. There's coffee, lemonade, refreshments. Everyone's welcome to go over there for a time of um, refreshments and conversation. But here now, a final benediction. Oh, loving God, let us go out from this time of worship ready to behold, to behold your splendor and your glory all around us, knowing that the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with us now and always. Amen. Thank you.